Hello everyone, Wylock here. Welcome back. I'm still fighting off the dregs of a cold, but I'm too excited about this video to wait any longer, so you're just going to have to tough it out. Today's part two in my journey to fill out my D&D terrain collection with stuff that's inspired by the art direction from the original Baldur's Gate games. This includes a staple which I have put off for many years, that is modular city walls, or castle walls. As you can see, fits like a glove. And the idea is, since I can make any shape wall that I want, I could model any given portion of a major city. Also, I stumbled upon a natural stone painting block technique scheme whatever that I am finally happy with, so I'm excited to share that with you. I'm not going to waste any time reiterating techniques and stuff from the previous video. I'm going to assume that you've seen it. So with all that said, let's get cracking. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. First of all, remember this building from the previous video? The roof is too blue, and the grays are too dark. To fix the oversaturation on the roof, I rebased with a light gray, and mixed up what I hoped would be a more desaturated wash. Turns out, it wasn't. I did it again. Third time's a charm, repainted with light gray a third time, and then mixed up mostly black and purple ink with matte medium, but this still isn't... You know what, screw this thing, let's just move on. When you look around the city, you see a lot of these half-sized buildings with a sloped roof and they're on stilts. I think they're storehouses of some kind, and they're all over the place. They reuse the same model and reskin it in most of the cities. So I built one. Its overall footprint is 3 by 6 inches, and the techniques are the same, double corrugated for the skeleton. The only real new thing is that I'm using these square wooden dowels, available at any crafting supply store. And I built it such that the corners are still exposed, so that those wooden planks can slide right in there perfectly in the future. This way I don't have to paint them in place, which means I can paint both surfaces much quicker and without any worry of color spilling onto the other. It gives a very nice clean look at the end, consistent with the source image. Also, like two hours before recording this narration, I felt like whipping up a fifth building just to fill out the final scene. And I honed in on this simple little square building here, easy as it gets. So this was a 90 minute speed build. What do you think? Nailed it? Nailed it. Now having ditched the road tiles, I still want to introduce some green. All the buildings in the city tend to have these patches of lawn. So with graphics medium chipboard, links in the video description below, I'm just going to cut out some six and 12 inch lengths just ensuring that one side is flat, then basing it with foliage green. That's literally what this color is called, foliage green. And from there, I'm just going hog wild with all these great products from Army Painter. Basically, I got onto Amazon, searched for Army Painter, and clicked yes. Give me everything. Grass tufts, flowers, battlefield rock, brown dirt, dark grass, light grass, all of it. I had no plan here. So a good coat of white glue, and then I spread that out. I like to use my finger. I don't waste time wetting a brush. You also get a smoother result by using the pad of your finger to spread out white glue. And then like an experimental chef, I'm just adding ingredients here one at a time, playing around with it, having some fun. Now, of course, this isn't exactly how you're supposed to use static grass. You're supposed to use a static applicator. I don't have one of those, nor do I have the patience. I think it makes for fine flock anyway. I just take nice thick clumps and I press them on pretty hard to that white glue. And that tends to build up a nice carpet after you shake the excess off. Now, coming back the next day and as expected, they're warped pretty bad. Look at this. They tip around. This is unusable. However, as we've done many times on the channel before, we'll paint a healthy thick layer of white glue on the bottom and let them sit for 24 to 36 hours. And when we come back, the warp is counteracted. They're flat as a board. Wonderful. Now onto the main event. Look at these city walls. This is what I honed in on, and I'm not going to duplicate them exactly, but like everything else here, I'm doing work that's inspired by it. So first of all, finally, after, I don't know, nine years on YouTube, I am going to make a Pringles can tower. This lip here at the bottom, it flares out, changes the radius, not good. So I'm going to chop away the first centimeter or so of length. Then each end is get, just gets a circle of, actually this is chipboard. Now I know I don't want my bricks to be a perfect subway, so I can't use a jig or a roller because those will have repeated patterns. I have to do it one by one to get the look that I want. So I began milling down XPS foam about two millimeters thick. 
Some are 2mm, some are 3mm. Then variance in thickness comes into play later on. Saves a step of having to imprint and make some of the bricks deeper than others. Just cut them a different depth to begin with. Now I got a bunch of these slats and I'm going to rip them at one centimeter wide. Straight down all the way and this will give me clumps of flat sticks that are a centimeter wide. So far I'm at about 90 seconds of effort for this whole thing. And once those are all ripped up, I clump them together on the table and with no guide needed, just freehand them through and cut up bricks. Most of them I kept to a centimeter just eyeballing it, so they're roughly square. But since I'm doing it by hand with no guide, the edges are a little irregular, which is good. That's what I want. They won't look like perfect rectangles or squares. And I do chop some of them a little narrower and some a little wider. Now, once that's done, they're all sort of slightly clumped together. They come apart very easily, though. So I pick them up and just begin scrunching them around in my hands squeezing and rolling and twisting. And these small foam bricks will not rip or tear. You'll see that they don't. All this is doing is roughening up the edges, softening the corners and giving them a little bit of texture. Some people would toss them in a can with some rocks at this point. I don't think that's very efficient. I think this is a lot faster. It's easy enough to texturize them later on with a tin foil ball, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'll finish scrunching these up and within two and a half minutes or so of total effort, I've got all the bricks ready to start gluing on to the Pringles can. Here's a little ASMR for you. To glue them on, I use hot glue. I lay down about two inches at a time because it stays hot enough, just long enough to lay down two inches worth of bricks. It's a little tricky because it's a curved surface, takes a little longer, believe it or not. The flat walls are bigger, but went quicker. And you'll see that in a moment, but I try to get some offset where I can and other places there's not. Mixing up the sizes that I pull from the pile and, and since I ripped some of them a little smaller, there's always a way to finish out a row cleanly. Oh, and here's a tip, I wish I had done this. Paint the Pringles can black before you start gluing these on. Just makes it easier later on in the priming stage. Now once I reach the top is when I switch to proper full-size bricks. So not shown on camera, but with the hot wire table, I cut up a bunch of one centimeter cubed bricks. It only took a minute. And these are hot glued around the top. I try and apply glue on two surfaces for strength so that they stick to each other and the can. And the net effect is this. It looks like the whole thing is made of hand laid bricks when really it's just the top row. We'll get to painting in a moment. For the walls, I decided on a standard 12 inch length for the walls. And for the height, I just did something a little less than the Pringles can. I don't remember what it was. So I'm using double corrugated cardboard, although single corrugated would work for this purpose. You could get away with it. Need two rectangles, 12 by whatever the height is. Then I chamfered the two short edges like this. With a fresh blade and using a sawing motion, not a pushing down, but a back and forth sawing motion, this can be very easily and smoothly cut, even freehand. And as you can see, this is a real intense angle. I am really cutting in there. This is to make sure it fits around the circle later on. You'll see what I mean. This part's really technically not necessary, but just for looks, I'm going to seal up the corrugation with paper and hot glue. Could also use masking tape or painter's tape, but I ran out of it and I could go to the store, but then I'd have to put pants on and I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to use paper. Then I cut three rectangles to set the inside structure. Now the width of these will dictate the overall width of the wall. I made these one and three quarters of an inch so that the overall width is two and a half inches plus the width of the bricks. This was after some experimentation and just seeing what felt and looked right while also accounting for the fact that I want a two inch base large monster to comfortably sit on top of the wall if needed. Next, I'm going back to graphics medium chipboard and cutting a two and a half by 12 inch rectangle, then tracing the Pringles can onto it such that the arc of the circle touches the two corners like you see me doing here. This doesn't have to be an exact trace. 
And after you do the first one, you should save the off cut and use it as a jig for your future ones. But the end result is this. You cut out an insert that fits like a glove right up against the circular tower. To ensure everything stays square and level, the assembly order is this. Beads of hot glue all along one end of the wall, including those three structure points, and then attaching it to the chipboard runner at the top, making sure that the outer edge is perfectly flush. No need to look at the other side as you're setting it. Just focus on that outer edge and make sure it is perfectly flush. Then to attach the other wall, hot glue on one end of the wall itself, quickly hot glue on the three structure points, and lay it down. You'll know that it's perfectly aligned with the other wall because you can visually line this up with the chipboard runner at the top. No need to look at the other wall, just look at the runner. As long as it's flush and centered, you should be good. Also, the placement of those three structure points in the middle don't really matter. You just want to make sure the two outer ones are set inward enough that the circle of the Pringles tower won't hit them. So here we go, completed structure for a modular rampart wall section. Nice and clean, nice and flush. And you should spray paint this black before you start attaching bricks. I wish I had done that. Some of them I did, some of them I forgot. Anyway, I prepared a ton of bricks, and again, that only took like two to five minutes or something like that. And I prepare a pile on each side so I can go back and forth, left and right hand, real quickly. Two or three inches of hot glue at a time, and then bam, bam, bam. The first row takes a little while because you want to make sure it's flush with the chipboard at the top. Oh, and by the way, do the top row first. Work your way down. Don't begin at the ground. Once the top row is set, though, you have a firm jig for the second row and all the ones beyond. You'll be able to move real fast. And just like the towers, I get actual one centimeter blocks to put along the top. And I elected to only do one side. This is to leave room for a two inch miniature base. And also, I don't know, I just kind of like the look of having the outside of the wall with that fortification and none on the inside. So you can run platforms or ladders or stuff up to it. I don't know. Now, once the bricks are all on the piece is when I do the texturing. Tin foil ball, classic trick, roll, roll, roll. 30 seconds per side, 30 seconds per tower. I think this is a lot quicker and easier than putting them in a can and then having to sift them out later on. As an initial sealant and primer for these fragile foam bricks, I use Mod Podge, tinted with a little bit of black paint just to help me see where I've been already. And this gets slathered on. I'm actually using a brush from a makeup kit. It's very thick, the bristles are soft. Excellent hobby hack there. Makeup brush kits, excellent for grunt work like this. Now I also prepared a test swatch of bricks on some junk cardboard. It's pretty big so I cut it in half so that I can have two tests going on at the same time. Then I began experimenting with colors and techniques. Brushes, washes, order of steps, different colors, all of that. Realistic Stone has evaded me for years and I repainted these test swatches. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, but twelve times before I finally found the arrangement of colors I liked. So don't be disheartened if your first results don't come out the way you want. It happens to me too, it happens to everybody. Ultimately, here is what I came up with. A somewhat dark khaki color for the overbrush. So you can see the splotchy black finish of the Mod Podge. That's okay, really doesn't matter. In fact, splotchy is a little better. And I'm overbrushing with this, it's actually a 50-50 mix of fawn and barn wood. Why a 50-50 mix? Because I liked each of them on their own so much, and I couldn't decide which to use, so I used both. But this is a good overbrush. It's a, it's a dry brush, but with a whole bunch of paint on the bristles. You can see it's not getting into any of the cracks. Some bricks are getting 100% coverage, and others are getting partial. By the end, it's like 90, 95% coverage. That's what you can see here. That's what you're going for. Then I picked a very light gray, this is dove gray, and a very dark gray, this is gray storm, to which I actually added a little bit of black, not shown on camera. The key is for these to be very notably different from the beige, they really need to pop out because we're going to do a wash later and that's going to tamp everything down. So this is a light, light gray, almost white. And the dark gray is a dark, dark gray. I'm picking out maybe one brick for every two by two inch surface area. Now here's some inks. You could use paint for this, but you just need a nasty olive ochre type of color. This ended up being, I think like 50-50 sienna and green with a bit of black and then adding water so that the whole mixture is 50-50 water and ink. But again, you could water down acrylic paint, I think, and get a perfectly serviceable result. I began by dabbing this on with a mid-sized junk brush. 
Then I got smart and switched to a sponge. What I found during those 12 repaints is it's important to water it down properly so you can tint the bricks, not cover it completely with this color. And it is stark. I mean, you can see it. It's a nasty olive color and it's showing up a lot. Again, the wash coming up is going to really tamp everything down. So if you're doing this, don't be surprised and don't be scared if the project still looks really cartoonish and bad at this point. It kind of should. I'm also chasing with some paper towel to dab away excess for some of the harder hits and a little bit of smearing where needed to sort of blend it in. You get a hang for it after doing one piece. And now the wash I've been talking about. This is a heavily watered down black. It's actually not watered down even quite enough because you can see I went right back to the water cup as I usually do, but a nice watered down black wash over the entire thing. After giving that a few hours to completely dry, including all the black that probably pooled up in the cracks, then it's time to move on to dry brushing. This is French vanilla, and it's just a very light dry brush over the entire piece. Remember, you can always add more dry brushing, but you really can't take it off. So begin subtle. For comparison, here's two of them next to each other, pre and post dry brushing. The one on the right, you can see that olive color actually dried pretty muted and it kind of looks cool on its own merits. I was partially tempted not to proceed, but I'm glad I did. I love this result so much that I'm probably gonna go repaint all my dungeon tiles with it. Again, tireless experimentation and persistence is key. It took me 12 tries to get this look. And I assure you, the intermediate ones looked terrible. These coffee stirrers are like my new favorite crafting product. First, I blacked out the tops of the pieces, then painted in some white glue, laid these down, and painted them brown. I also followed up with a dark, rich brown ink. And look at that. Oh my gosh. It was frustrating getting here, but I'll tell you what, it was worth it. I could not be happier about these. I haven't been this excited to run my next D&D &D session in a long time. I made five towers and five wall sections. So if I wanted, I could lay out a perfectly pentagonal keep and it would have a lot of surface area in there for playing. I'm also fairly happy with how all the foliage platters came out. I don't know much of anything about doing nature-based terrain, so there's no rhyme or reason to what I laid down, but I think it mostly sort of looks like the game. The particular grass that I chose isn't quite as emerald green as the game, but it is perhaps more realistic. I don't know, I, maybe I can spritz it with an airbrush at an angle or something. We'll save that for the third video, if I do anything at all. Also, I had a fun thought the other day. What if I were to rebase all my miniatures on clear acrylic discs, but paint the rims of those discs with a fluorescent green? Should I do that? Would that be neat? Might be going too far. For those of you who don't get that, if you haven't played the video game, all the little character models that you can click on have a green circle around them on the screen. Anyways, there's a story around every corner in Baldur's Gate. That's what I've tried to illustrate here. The colorful people that are peppered around the maps are half of the aesthetic. So I painted up a whole bunch of miniatures here in varying fashions to at least have something demonstration worthy in these videos. Also the random treasure scatter you see I did in a previous video and I'll put a card to that on the screen. So as I said earlier, I ditched the city tiles that I made in the first video and instead I'm going to use a battle mat. This is Cobblestone City by Frontline Gaming Mats. Frontline is also a friend of the channel. This looks way better and is going to be way more flexible in the future. I have a few other mats I'm going to test out as well. By the way, all the various scatter terrain you see here, like the treasure piles and the weapon racks, I did those in other recent videos. Just check my backlog. If you've just found my channel, I have a couple hundred other tutorials like this. Feel free to subscribe and binge. The Wylock Nation grows more every day. Join us. Oh, and I've also published a few cheap D&D &D modules. Check the links in the video description below. They're pretty good. They're not great, but they're not bad. You know, they're just okay. Anyway, it's a cheap, easy way to support me if you want. Or a Patreon.
all Wylock related funding goes directly into the final development stages of my cyberpunk system, Neon Skies, coming out hopefully by the end of 2023. I am ludicrously excited about that project. Don't forget to find all 40,000 of us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. We'd love to see you there sharing your projects with us. I'm Wylock, thank you for watching. Apologize again for my nasally cold voice today. And until next time, make things and play games.